We're here at the cable show at the booth of Digital Smiths, and we have the privilege of speaking with Matthew Berry, who is the uh, Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of Digital Smiths. Thanks a lot, Barry, for taking some time with yeah, us. Thank you. Um, so from, from a at least very public uh, perspective, Digital Smith is new into the cable industry, but un under the radar, you've been working with the cable industry for a while now. Yep. Um, so I want to explore that a little bit, but let's start out just talking about what D Digital Smiths has been doing with Discovery and how, how your technology has been utilized across the web over these past few years. Sure, sure. So um, over the last probably two years, you're starting to see a, uh, a merge between the cable industry and traditional web or content owners. So when you look at how networks has been pushing content on the internet today, um, you're starting to see those same user experiences pushed into the service provider market. So cable operators are now forced to rethink how they drive different navigational experiences for the consumer. Um, and a large part of that is done by discovery. Uh, so Digital Smiths for a number of years have been in the discovery space, uh, creating data for search and recommendation algorithms. Those algorithms are now being used by service provider to drive discovery experiences for the consumer in the living room. So they're finding things like what's on television right now, what's in my VOD catalog, how can I best find and navigate that. Uh -huh. Now, what are some of the um, discovery incremental applications that, that are in your portfolio of uh, functionalities? Um, well, when you look at discovery, discovery is a kind of a broad term, yes. right? Um, and even when you say search and recommendations, it's you, you peeled the onion once, but it's still <laughs> fairly broad. Recommendations comes in a lot of different forms. You have things that are recommended based on what's popular. Uh, you have things that are recommended based on your behavior profile, or maybe your friend's profile, maybe what's going on tonight on the set-top box. Uh, so there's really a lot of different ways that you can frame up recommendation. And each one of those uses a different kind of data and potentially a different algorithm to drive that, that right. recommendation. So in that context, you're doing all of those? Um, or we are. Emphasizing certain of those over others? or Absolutely. And so as you start to see, uh, there's a lot of different kinds of data that's coming into these systems, yeah. uh, specifically discovery. And so data is the foundational layer of what's driving the discovery experience. So if your data is noisy, you're going to have noisy recommendations. So you really have to figure out ways to collect and normalize this data uh, across many different data sets. And when I say many, now all of a sudden service providers are reaching out to a lot of different online providers. Um, so, for instance, like Metacritic or Rotten Tomatoes or Common Sense Media, those are just a few form, but there's literally dozens of these, and they all have unique ID sets mm -hmm. that they go by. So there's not a real common ID that they can play with, uh, and that's where we come in. So we ingest all this data, we aggregate it and normalize it to a single ID that allows the service providers to use that data. Are you doing something in the vein of, of actually creating metadata from multiple sources that it, it not specific to this one or that one, but you know just basically crawling out there and digging stuff up to better define content? Is that an approach you take? That is. Um, for about eight years now, we've been working with the studios on helping them develop metadata. And we've developed what's called time-based metadata. So it's metadata that describes what's going on inside the, the video. So specifically the scene or the frame of video. It could tell who's in the frame, where they're at, what they're talking about, any actions, objects. So we have all that information about all the content. And we join that data with all the other third party that, that's mm -hmm. out there. And that gives us a much clearer picture as to what's going on on screen to make that recommendation. So, so with that, uh frame by frame kind of thing, you're actually pro running the, the specific content through your own processors to, to extract that information? That's right. That's right. So we get a lot of the, the video from the studios directly. Uh, we'll catalog and ingest that, and then we give them access to that data. And they'll use that data for other purposes besides discoveries. Yeah, that's my next question. It sounds like that's pretty valuable stuff for all kinds of things. Yeah, as you can imagine, there's uh, decades and decades of video in these vaults that uh, uh, just not catalog, so to speak, right? right. Um, and so now all of a sudden they have access to very specific information within the video. So when they're licensing content uh, or want to just understand what's available to push out to their networks, 
they have a much deeper understanding of that. What about the television programs? And, and I mean, uh, are you operating at two layers in terms of the depth of, of what you, you're offering in, in information and metadata? We do. So we have a VOD effort, uh, which is on the theatrical side or film side. Uh, and then on the linear, it's a little bit different because the linear is such a large catalog. And growing right? every minute. That's right. So, you know, kind of a rough number we use, about 20,000 unique linear assets every 30 days. When you compare that to a typical VOD catalog side of maybe 75,000, it's, it's very, very different. Yeah. Um, and so the processes in which you take to catalog that is very different. So we've elected to partner with uh, the networks to help them and so we have a tool set that they use and then they'll catalog that data for us versus oh. on the theatrical side we're doing it for the studios. How pervasive is that? Is it hit or miss in terms of which ones you're working with or, or is, is there actually a, 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 a database being compiled around television that is analogous to what you described with the movies? Yeah, I mean, so the linear side is fairly new. Where you're starting to see a lot of the data uh, being driven is, of course, in discovery, um, but you're also seeing second screen experiences. Mm -hmm. So the networks are using this now to drive interactive television and, and targeted advertising. So they're using that data to understand how to best place an advertisement. But we think that that data really is, for us, is probably even more relevant to discovery because now we understand at a consumer level maybe why they're watching it because we understand what's on screen and we can correlate with what's on screen to their viewing habits and we can better predict what they might like in the future. Wow. So this isn't quite to NSA proportions of big data, but it's sounding like it's getting there. So you've introduced a service for processing this. It's um, something that people can use you for to handle all this. That's right. That's right. And that's been going on uh, for almost eight years. Um, and then it was about maybe three years ago that we saw the window of opportunity where we could start using this data in the living room. Um, and so search and recommendations was just starting to be talked about by the service provider market. Uh, and at that time we started really ratcheting up our efforts around marketing to the service provider and working with them on different prototypes. And they liked what they saw. Um, and today we're the leaders in the North American market. So the, the, uni, the Unified Data Service, describe that a little bit and what, what that brings to the table. Sure. Um, so earlier I was talking about how there was a lot of disparate third-party data sets, um, but probably more unique is the sense you have kind of two incumbents in the market. You have TMS and Roby. They have their own IDs. Um, and then all of a sudden, if you start looking at a number of other data providers that need to map that data to a TMS or Rovi. It becomes very difficult because there's just, as we said earlier, there's an awful lot of linear content out there. And so there's no real natural way to automatically reconcile that data together. So we approach the problem probably a little uniquely. We have an automated process that knocks out a good portion of it, but then we have a manual curation that will map all that data to a common ID. And then that common ID can be used by the service provider to reach out and, and access a number of third-party services. So for example, if they wanted to track uh, Twitter buzz, so they want to understand well, what, what are people tweeting about right now relevant to what's on screen right now, they can take that ID, pass it into the systems and get the current buzz or tweets that are going on about that television show. So you're able to actually, uh, from, from a live standpoint, deliver a fairly immediate assessment of how something is, is translating in, in, on the social front. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's been a number of white papers recently released on how Twitter correlates to popularity, yeah. and we've seen that too. Yeah. Um, because we're the discovery experience in the living room, we see what people are watching, and we can correlate that to what's being tweeted, tweeted about. Uh, and we see a direct correlation between those two. So that's got to also be huge as far as planning for the content players and, and how they're rolling things out and trying things and, and, and even the service providers as far as what, what resonates with their marketplace. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, there's no question that that's happening, uh, but we're just at the beginning stages of it. So service providers today are uh, very quickly trying to figure out how they can get their time to market reduced in their next gen discovery experiences. And that's ultimately going to drive uh, better planning on how they roll out content and target content particular users. But I think that that'll start happening sometime next year. Yeah, so you have relationships with um, cable operators and service providers, um, it, it's some significant relationships that 
tie into their introduction of, say, uh, multi-screen services and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, how, how in, in terms of long-term evolution, how do you see them putting all this to use? And, and you just alluded to some of that, but, uh, you know, is, is this going to become, in your estimation, just part of their operations in a fundamental way, or is it where it drives some marketing, it drives upselling, it drives this, it drives that, or, or is it is it going to be kind of funneled into certain applications that are just happen to be with an IP device? Yeah, so I think if I were to if I were to evaluate that, you know, there's the nice to have and then the, the pains. And I think that there's without a doubt that this is a real pain point for the service providers. Um, and when you look at what it's doing in the living room, it's foundational because it more or less is replacing the guide. And as we know, the guide has been um, what you might call the home screen in the living room for a long time. And so I think the whole notion of changing the guide is a very important piece and one that they're not taking lightly. And because it's so centric to the core of their business can affect ultimately the top line revenue of their business, they're selecting their partners very carefully. Um, and they're looking at those partners in the sense, what are you solving today? And then what are you going to solve in the next five years for us? Uh -huh. are, are you coming in primarily with OEM partners, like middleware suppliers and, and, and developers of, of UIs, um, you know, uh, user interfaces for the specific service providers, are you going directly to them and then they're saying to their suppliers, hey, work with these guys? Uh, m most of our tier one customers are all direct. Um, when you start getting into the tier two, tier three markets is where we start using partners, uh -huh. uh, simply because they just don't have the resources that the tier one guys have. Uh -huh. um, but there's there's a awful lot of money being spent on the tier one side and developing a lot of these front end applications. With respect to how it is affecting the actual user guides, are you seeing some pretty compelling applications of your technology in the context of some of these new guides? Yeah, although it's early. You know, everybody has their idea on what they think is going to work, and my guess is 90% of what we think is going to work is simply not going to work in the user experience. Um, they do have the benefit, though, is that there's been a number of folks in the market for a number of years, like Netflix uh, and Apple. And so I think they can piggyback on all the mistakes that they may have made to understand and learn from that to develop a better experience. Uh -huh. Of course, in moving, moving from uh, the personalized uh, web devices from the PC down to the handsets uh, into the living room, you now have a new challenge, which is it's not about one person watching and discovering, it's about a whole bunch of people. Are you doing anything to refine how your system works in that TV experience versus the personalized? Yeah, so there, there's a number of approaches, and, and I'm not sure today we clearly understand what's going to work. I think there's the issue of privacy that the consumer's worried about when they try to identify who's using that particular uh -huh. device. Um, so you're seeing television manufacturers come out with things like facial recognition or voice fingerprinting. Yeah. Um, you're also seeing uh, the cable operators just simply providing login interfaces. Um, but I think as you're starting to see more and more mobile devices control the television or the set-top box, that mobile device by nature it belongs to the, yeah. to the user. But then again, it may be a shared experience that one person happens yeah. to be using the remote. Uh, as yeah. the mobile is the remote. I, I guess what I'm what I'm hearing is that there's some effort to begin to create um, a kind of a understanding of who the the household members are and what their general tastes are. So there's almost a kind of a generic by time of day, by day of week, and and yeah. that kind of thing as to. They, these are likely to be the viewers at this time. These are likely to be. Is that something that you're getting into? Well, you can, you kind of got me on that. I was avoiding that a little bit, but essentially, <laughs> that's how we think's going to uh, the path is going to be laid. That it, it's going to be about the patterns and the behavior that are going to determine who's using the device. Uh -huh. um, there's definitely telltale characteristics on how maybe you navigate versus myself. Um, in terms of the speed of navigation, how we navigate, where we navigate, the kind of search terms we use. And we can use that information to essentially uh, model out that user to better predict who they are when they're sitting down to watch content. Wow. So how, how does this work as far as the piece that you're supplying and, and integrating with everything else that's out there in terms of the middleware suppliers, the UI suppliers, you know, to the extent that you're integrating in with the 
back end and picking up all their data. Is is each one just a, a big integration project? Is it, it? I mean, it doesn't sound like this is something that's just straightforward and you plug it into your system. Yeah. Um, I think traditional cable is um, is very complex, and when you look at the uh, merger between online and cable, you're starting to see a lot of the ways that the online community have been doing business pushed into cable that simplify a lot of things. And one of those is uh, software as a service or cloud-based solutions. Um, those solutions are traditionally accessed through an API. Uh, they're authenticated. Um, and that's how our infrastructure is laid out. Uh, we don't have to deploy it that way, but what has ended up happening is, is folks that have opted to do it the traditional way where we deploy hardware in their data center, uh, they've realized very quickly if they want to scale quickly, then we get time to market reduced, that the cloud is the way to go. Yeah, so if they really want to get into this, and then and, and, and that trend's already underway, it's, you're going to have to abstract that whole middleware yeah. and, 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 and move that to the cloud. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a lot of that discussion here this yeah. week. Well, Matt, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank really you. Really good to talk with you. Yeah, nice to talk to you.